Pan-African Review is a platform that challenges assumptions about Africa and a space for introspective perspectives on matters of concern to Africans. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pan-African Review podcast. This is your online spot for African discourse. I am your host, Mahatma Olimwengu, and today we have a very special guest for you today. His name is Dr. Frederick Goloba Mutebi. He's a political scientist with special interest in political economy. He's a graduate of Makerere University in Uganda and the London School of Economics and Political Science in the UK. Today, we'll be discussing the situation in the DRC, He's written extensively about it in the Pan-African Review. Yeah, so I hope you enjoy this conversation and share it to your friends and families. And we'll be back with Dr. Frederick Goloba Mutebi. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time. I know it's been a bit complicated recently. So we wanted to discuss um, the situation in the Congo with um, M23. And just like we have a few questions here for you. We'll keep it very brief just to get your um your out your take on it because we've um I've done some research on you trying to understand this conflict. So let's start off like you've written extensively on the conflicts in the DRC. Could you just walk us through the historical timeline of the rise of M23? Well M M23 uh appeared on the scene sometime I think around 2012. And as you may know, M23 is only new in the sense that the name changed, but it was CNDP before that. So a lot of M23 activists were in CNDP. Right. Now, CNDP signed uh, agreements with the government of Congo, then led by Joseph Kabila. Um, And those agreements uh, were signed on March 23rd. I think this was 2009. And for three years, from 2009 to 2012, these agreements, uh, the provisions of these agreements had not been effected. Mm. And uh, those agreements had very specific things that they obliged the government of DRC to do, one of which was to facilitate the return of uh, Congolese refugees who were stuck in refugee camps in Rwanda to their country, uh, which is uh, Congo. We are talking of Kinyarwanda speaking Congolese, right. uh, whom some people mistaken refer to as Vanyamlenge. Vanyamlenge are just a subset of Kinyarwanda speaking Congolese, but for some reason people think that every Kinyarwanda speaking Congolese is a Vanyamlenge. So the, the thing was that these people should be facilitated to return to their homes and farms in the east of the DRC. Uh, the other thing was that uh, some of these combatants or ex-combatants at the time were supposed to be reabsorbed into the Congolese military. And there were other provisions, but the government of Congo had not fulfilled any of these. So I think around 2011, they started agitating that the government should be uh, should fulfill um, uh, what they had agreed. Right. The government was dragging its feet and it was out of the failure by the government to um, implement or effect the agreement that M23 then uh, chose to go to war with the government of the DRC. Mm. At least, I mean, in brief, that's that's my understanding. Okay, so you also wrote um, that there can be, quote, no solution to the M23 insurgency without addressing popular animosity towards Banya Rwanda. In the Congo. So, given the violent and volatile context in Congo, how could Africans go about addressing such sensitive issues? I'm not sure that this is an issue for Africans. If you're talking of Africans beyond Congo, this is an issue for Congolese. It's yeah, primarily it, an it issue. It's over Africa. into Rwanda and uh, Tanzania. Like it is affecting the East African region at the very least, right? Yeah, but what I'm telling you is that it's primarily the responsibility of the government of Congo and yeah. other groups living in Congo to address this issue. The government of Congo could simply start by providing the necessary security in the regions where these people have been expe- expelled from and enabling them to return and then provide security to prevent them being harassed and uh, killed and molested 
Mm. Uh, it is the responsibility of the government of Congo to sensitize its population of non Kinyarwanda speaking people to respect the rights of Kinyarwanda speaking Congolese. Uh, so what would I you mean, think? That's primarily what. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, what would you think is the greatest failure in that regard of the government of Congo addressing these issues? Where do you think they've sincerely, severely dropped the ball? Um, I think that Congo does have all kinds of problems. Uh, right. If you have have been uh, to Congo, you would have n not failed to notice. It's a country with a very dysfunctional state. Uh, the Congolese state has very limited reach. Um, they do not have the infrastructure or even the capacity to ensure security in their own territory. As you might know, mm. there are several insurgent movements uh, originating in Uganda, in Burundi, in Rwanda, which are based in the DRC. And the yeah. DRC army has been totally incapable of uh, um, guaranteeing the territorial integrity of the DRC. Now, if the government of the DRC could build a strong army that can eject these groups from Congo so that Rwandan insurgents can be pushed back into Rwanda, Ugandan insurgents can be pushed back into Uganda, Burundian insurgents can be expelled and pushed back into Burundi, then you have the beginnings of addressing this, this issue because primarily the expulsion of Kinyarwanda speaking people, primarily of Tutsi origin from Eastern DRC, was instigated by uh, this, these genocides, these people who committed genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Once they reached Congo, they decided to treat uh, Congolese Tutsis in the same way that they had treated their uh, compatriots back, their Tutsi compatriots back in Rwanda. So well, their choice to flee to Rwanda was as a result of insecurity perpetrated by these, uh, these insurgents. Right, so um, are you referring to the, um, the FDLR also? Yeah, FDLR is, uh, FDLR is the reincarnation of another two groups because uh, those groups, there was a group called Alir, there were other groups, uh, FDLR was, was the name that was given to this group at a later stage, but yeah, they are the same people. The name of the group changes, but the people remain the same. Okay, so um, okay, this is a more of a Pan-African question, I guess. So as Africans, we obviously trace a myriad of our current woes back to the damaging effects of colonialism. So what are the most profound residuals of colonization that can be observed in the DRC? Well, I, I think that colonialism was a bad thing, and I agree that it has had lasting effects. But do we Africans sometimes uh, prioritize the condemnation of colonialism a bit too much, uh, rather than facing up to our responsibilities? Look, there are several ethnic groups in Uganda, some of which are cross-border or have a cross-border presence. There are ethnic groups in Tanzania that have a cross-border presence. In Kenya, same thing. And we haven't seen the kind of ethnic cleansing in those countries that we see in the DRC. And those countries were also colonized. So the problem in the DRC is not primarily that of colonialism. Colonialism has had the same effects. There are only a few countries where ethnic cleansing happens, and this is the responsibility of governments that are running those countries at the same at this time, as well as communities which have been taught to um, be uh, feel a certain type of animosity towards their fellow compatriots. I mean, this is a problem that can be addressed by the government of the DRC, either on its own or working with other uh, countries in the region uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen. We, we, we can't really stretch our arm to colonial rule and say, you know, this is a problem. Of right. that, that, so that, I really don't... Yeah, I think that's a fair point. So on that note, do you think the DRC's government, uh, their sentiments, that portray Rwanda as the aggressors in the DRC and M23 as mere vessels for Rwanda's interests. Do you think those sentiments have any merit? I don't think they do, because as far as I'm concerned, I mean, if Congolese say that Rwanda is the problem, is the, is the one causing insecurity in their country, I think that they fall short of defining how or why this mm -hmm. is happening. Now, for one thing is, what if the Congolese army had the capacity to push FDLR out of Congo so that FDLR does not um, 
uh, act as a main actor in this in the persecution of Congolese Tutsis, and therefore, in their flight from Congo to Rwanda, why why would they still say you know Rwanda is the problem? Rwanda is the problem in as far as Rwanda has been insisting that the government of Congo should do something about FDLR. Now FDLR, as I have said to you, is the one that is at the center of persecuting. Uh, Congolese Tutsis, or it is at, at least one of the major actors in that persecution. Okay. Now, the, the other thing is that uh, <clears throat> the government of Rwanda all, is also, also has concerns about FDLR, because FDLR has uh, designs on the territorial integrity of Rwanda. They want the, one of their declared objectives is to return to Rwanda and continue with the genocide that they carried out here almost 30 years ago. So in that sense, Rwanda has every right to be concerned about this group. And whenever this group uh, shows any presence anywhere close to the border of Rwanda, you can't really expect the government of Rwanda to just sit by or sleep yeah. and say, oh, well, we don't mind that they're there. Yeah. Because should they go to sleep, this group is going to find its way inside Rwanda and cause insecurity in Rwanda. So. Rwanda does have interests in Congo. We all know them. Mm. Now, the problem, as far as I can see, or one of the main problems, is that the government of Congo has been unable or unwilling to address FDLR as a security threat to Rwanda, but also FDLR as a threat to Congolese Tutsi communities. Mm. Yeah, so how so this whole claim yeah, Rwanda's so problem, I think that claim doesn't really have the merit that some people give it. So would you say Rwanda is not, it, they are vulnerable, but not, um, it's not the biggest threat that they are facing right now from FDLR? How vulnerable do you think Rwanda is to the FDLR threat? You know, some people claim that FDLR is not a threat to Rwanda. And mm. therefore, when Rwanda invokes FDLR <laughs> as a threat, oh, well, Rwanda is exaggerating, oh, well, Rwanda is using FDLR as a threat, uh, as an excuse for invading Congo to look for minerals and resources and so on and so forth. Now, right. certainly anyone who knows Rwanda well would agree that the FDLR is not a military threat. The FDLR, I personally doubt, has the capacity to invade Rwanda and take over the government or invade Rwanda and occupy territory for any amount of, uh, any length of time. So it's not a direct military threat to Rwanda. But that, that does not mean that FDLR is not a threat at all. And I will explain to you from my understanding why FDLR is a threat or how it is a threat. Now, FDLR is a threat to Rwanda in, in the following sense. Ru the, the heart of Rwanda's tourism industry is in the northwest of the country, mm. close to the border with DRC. Now, tourism is a major uh, foreign exchange earner for Rwanda. And therefore, the economy of Rwanda is highly dependent on the revenues they generate from tourism. Mm. Now, they cannot afford to endanger their tourism industry by allowing FDLR to infiltrate the country to cause insecurity in the northwest of the country. Because if they did, if FDLR invaded Rwanda and occupied the northwest or caused insecurity in that region, Rwanda's tourism industry would literally collapse. Now, if that happened, it means that it would really have such a huge negative impact on Rwanda's economy. So in that sense, it is in the interest of Rwanda to make sure that FDLR never infiltrates the country to cause insecurity in that part of the region, which would have the secondary effect of uh, impacting very negatively on the tourism industry and therefore on the economy. It is in that sense that FDLR is a threat to Rwanda. Yeah, so it's a threat not to a, Rwanda's interests, a, but not Rwanda's sovereignty. Well, it depends on what, what uh, it depends on what you mean by Rwanda's sovereignty. Uh, uh, as I said, it is, it is a security threat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's not such a serious threat to Rwanda's territorial integrity. I, I don't think that they have the capacity to invade Rwanda and hold territory or to invade Rwanda and top of the government. I really don't think they do. But they have the capacity to infiltrate Rwanda and cause insecurity in that region, which happens to be the heartland of Rwanda's very important tourism industry.
Is peace in the DRC an honest agenda for MONUSCO, France and the United States, or do you think that perpetual conflict and instability in the region serves their interests more realistically? You know, my answer to that question is that I don't know. I don't know to what extent uh, MONUSCO, the US or France are interested in lasting peace in the DRC. But I'll go back to the point I made earlier, that it's not their responsibility to ensure that DRC is stable and peaceful and prosperous. It's not their responsibility. That's the responsibility of the government of the DRC and the people of the DRC. Now, if they had the capacity or if they had the willingness to develop their own capacity to take charge of their own security, then that question wouldn't arise. Rwanda is not stable and peaceful and prosperous as it is because of an external actor. They took charge of their own security. The DRC should do the same. Mm. So if somebody says, oh, do you think the US and France are interested in peace in the DRC? I think it's a redundant question. We should ask, is the government of Congo interested in security in the DRC? Mm. They should be. Uh, it doesn't strike me as if they take this responsibility seriously. Yes, but uh, MONUSCO has uh, declared FDLR, for instance, a priority agenda in the Congo. So why do you think they've never gone around to trying to deal with that issue? Well, I don't know why they have never gone around to dealing with it, but we know that they have never done it. Right. And we know that MONUSCO is, is a fairly sizable uh, entity. It has very large numbers of troops from all different countries. It has a very large and generous budget. Mm -hmm. Why they have never moved again against FDLR to neutralize it, that's a mystery to me. But I will tell you something else. In 2013, MONUSCO was able very quickly to mobilize the Force Intervention Brigade to neutralize M23. And all of us who have been watching this region for a very long time, we are quite astounded. Yeah. That this very ineffectual group that has never done anything effective against the FDLR had somehow found the capacity to neutralize another armed group. Now, yeah. why, is, why is it they have never done it against FDLR? I really don't know, but we know that they have never done it. And asking that question is a very good thing to do. Yeah, exactly. I think at, at, at best now all we can do is speculate and ask the questions, but we'll never really get to the bottom of it. We'll just know that they haven't done it yet. So, um, well, regarding SADC's decision to deploy and the EAC determination to stay in the DRC, are you afraid there might be a competition between regional blocs? Aren't these regional blocs undermining each other and ongoing uh, peace processes? Well, I, I, I don't know the details of uh, SADC's plan to deploy. I don't know where they are going to deploy. I know where the East African forces are. I wonder if SADC forces are going to be in the same place or if they're going to be in a different place. Hmm. I don't even know if SADC will deploy because uh, expressing the willingness to deploy or the ambition to deploy does not necessarily translate into deployment. Yeah. Um, I would like to but um, it took SADC a very long time to deploy troops in Mozambique, which is very close to the power centers or to, to the major actors in SADC. Mm. Mozambique had to run to Rwanda to for troops before SADC could pull its act together to deploy forces in Mozambique. Now, with the problems that are still there in Mozambique and with the performance that we have seen of SADC forces in Mozambique, I don't know whether they are going to be willing very quickly to deploy in the DRC. I still wait to see if that is going to happen. And I'm not aware that they have done anything spectacular in, in, in Mozambique. And therefore, I would wonder what they would do to make a difference in the DRC, which is a much bigger country, occupied by, by over 100 uh, rebel groups in an area that is probably as big as Mozambique or possibly twice the size of Mozambique. So I'm not sitting here thinking that yeah, uh, SADC is going to deploy. Um, but if it deployed, yeah, the question of how they're going to operate alongside the East African forces, that would be a very interesting question. Yeah, and I so think that the potential contradictions if those two forces were deployed at the same time would be immense. Yeah. Uh, the other question I would ask myself is to what extent do actors within SADC actually understand the story of Eastern DRC in all its complexity? Do they understand it more than 
uh, East African countries that neighbor DRC and that have been dealing with this issue for the last almost 30 years? I'm not sure if that's true. Yeah. Okay, I think that's a, that's a good point. So um, just lastly, finishing off, uh, many remember the two Congo wars. Are you, do you think there's a risk or is there a risk of regionalization of the conflict with the involvement of many African countries? I don't see that myself. Um, I don't see it because I think that there is now fairly sufficient understanding of the problems of the DRC in this region. And I'm not sure that there is a single country in this region that is willing to go and fight on the part of the DRC or fight on the side of the DRC. Who are they going to be fighting? Are they going to be fighting the citizens of the DRC who are fighting their own government on very solid grounds in that their rights have been violated, their parents have been expelled from the country, they're living in refugee camps, uh, they are not recognized as citizens of Congo simply because they speak Kinyarwanda, although as if Kinyarwanda, as if language is what determines citizenship. So I'm not sure that there is a country that is going to be willing to side with the government of the DRC to fight the citizens of the DRC who are fighting for their own rights. Um, but also I don't think that the government of the DRC has the capacity to launch a full-scale war for instance, I hear people talking about uh, their plans or their ideas about fighting with Rwanda. I'm not sure they have that capacity. Or right. even if they tried, I'm not sure that war would last a very long time. But I also would like to think that uh, Rwanda doesn't want a war with the, with the DRC and it's not going to get uh, into a fight with the DRC easily. Uh, so I don't really see this being generalized. Uh, Burundi has a good understanding of what's going on. The neighbor DRC understand the complexity of the situation in the DRC. Okay. And I don't think that they regard M23 as an external invader of the DRC. Nor do they necessarily buy the story that Rwanda is the problem. I think that they understand there are multiple insurgent groups inside DRC, all of which are causing insecurity. Now, M23 might be the best organized. It must be the most efficient at fighting the Congolese army. But I'm not sure that anyone buys the story that M23 is the problem causing insecurity in the DRC. There are many, many, many more groups there. And I don't know if any country would buy the simple story that, you know, without M23, there would be security and stability in the DRC. So I don't see a generalized war that involves all regional countries. The DRC has been beating war drums promising to take the war to Rwanda. My own reading from Kigali is that the Rwandans wouldn't, very, wouldn't be pulled into a fight with the DRC easily. Um, but I also don't believe that if the DRC started a war with Rwanda, they would be capable of pushing it for any uh, considerable period of time. I think that chances are they would be defeated fairly quickly. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, Dr. Frederick Guluba Mutebi, thank you very much. Uh, for taking some time. I know you've obviously had a very busy schedule, but we really appreciate you coming on. So thanks for that. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Cheers. Have a good day. Thank you, you too. Thank you very much for sticking with us till the end. Be sure to check out our website at panafricanreview.com and we will see you guys in the next episode.